Welcome to the Weekly Rate Update. I'm Craig Fuller here with John Paul Hempstead. JP, it's been a busy week due to the hurricane. We, yeah. we had Labor Day last week. We've now had uh, Dorian, who has outstayed her welcome. I don't know that she was ever welcome, but she's like a really obnoxious right. neighbor that just won't leave. Right. Uh, and it continues to go up the coast in kind of weird, unpredictable ways. Everyone thought Dorian was going to blow out to the Atlantic kind of wobbled to the to the west and it's starting to, to hit North Carolina as we sit here. Yeah, it's uh, it's really unfortunate that uh, she's causing this much damage. I mean, it, it, the, the, I guess the good news, if there is some silver lining, is that uh, the Outer Banks are less populated than other parts yeah. which she could have hit. And for supply chain purposes, not hitting directly into Savannah certainly uh, doesn't put as long as much long-term damage to the market as potentially could happen. Yeah, those ports are all scheduled to reopen today. Yeah, um, and uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern are accepting intermodal shipments to the ports. Um, so it seems like yeah, they've been spared you know any any kind of like significant damage. Yeah, yeah. So it, we we do wish the folks in the Outer Banks and dealing with storm and certainly in the Bahamas. Uh, the best of luck and our thoughts as as they go through this uh, situation uh, with the hurricane. Uh, it certainly has created a lot of uh, market activity. Yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of big projects going into Florida, into Alabama, into South Carolina, and we noticed that it actually did distort East Coast freight markets pretty significantly. Um, you know, spikes in inbound tender rejections on those coastal markets. You know, it's sort of like if you think about like. Um, you know, Fayetteville, Charlotte, Wilmington, Savannah, places like Carolina that. Carolina shot up because carriers just didn't want to, you know, under their consistent committed freight that yeah. like we typically see through tender transactions, they were rejecting those. Right. They weren't going to take, if they're going to go into the Carolina, it's going to be for relief purposes, not for traditional consistent freight. That's right. And we, we tried to, we wanted to try to isolate the impact of this storm. So we kind of, we looked at sort of how a benchmark East Coast rate into the Southeast has changed over the past seven days versus one into a hurricane zone. So we looked at Chicago to Atlanta, which has been an outperformer this year. It's been doing really well. It was up about 3% over the past seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. Um, to around you know buck eighty five, it's I don't know how long those distortions are going to last. It depend you know a lot of this stuff that's been staged will be eventually moved into warehouses. People will get their trailers back. The tractors will re-enter the market, but you know I think it I, it was cool for me because I was in touch with a lot of sort of younger brokerage executives who are really getting their first taste of urgent FEMA projects. A lot of guys working. You know, through Labor Day weekend, that have not that have not previously been involved. Is that yeah, yeah? And so that was really interesting. You know, they like they were getting projects awarded by FEMA at eight p.m. Yeah. that were supposed to pick up at eight a.m. the next That's, day. This is the nature of the beast. It was like, it was like forty truckloads. I mean, when I was uh, when I was in, in freight, you would get them and like they literally were behind because we were sort of that last first call or that first last call, I should say, and. Um, uh, we would get uh, projects that would happen after, so they would be like 12 hours late, and then we would have to go pick them up. So it was like, get there when you can. So. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, and you know, there's some other storm activity in the Atlantic. There's a, there's a depression out there off the coast of Africa that might turn into something. Who, who knows? But hopefully, you know, we can we we've sort of gotten the uh, disaster relief logistics companies, their reps. With that, without too much damage this season, and um, you know. yeah, I think it's it is it is unfortunate if you're in the path of the storm. It's certainly unfortunate for folks Bahamas. Like got yeah, just of course, racked. right. Uh, but I, I think from a freight standpoint, uh, long term impact seems to be mitigated because where the storm's hitting is just not a densely. It's neither economically viable from a freight production standpoint. And neither uh, that in, important in terms of density or consumption right, patterns. So right. it, it is unlikely to have a long-term impact. Yeah, these it like would be much, much more like we would see in some of those storms over the last couple of years that have had a really big sort of, uh, uh, you know, initially the reports were concerning, and then it sort of died out and, and really became an insignificant event in the long-term right. scheme. Yeah, that's. I think that's what's going to happen. But. <clears throat> 
there are some other like longer term, more profound market trends I think we should talk about. Yeah. The one that we've been talking about with the Freight Intel Group, our proprietary research team, is this spread between contract rates and spot rates and how that has evolved over the past year. So a year ago, in September 2018, the con uh, spot rates were about 12% below contract. That widened out as spot rates fell. Uh, really, you know, I think contract sort of slowly deteriorated contract uh, and spot fell a lot. You know, a lot of it has to do with portfolio concentration because when you measure, you know, the, the term contract and spot oftentimes get misunderstood or misinterpreted what they actually mean. I mean, at the end of the day, spot is about freight that's quoted and then moved typically within a couple of days. Contract freight is uh, typically freight that has prices that are set for some period of time. Right typically a year, and those contract rates tend to stay pretty stubborn if market conditions don't vary too much. The problem is that when you have a high variance between spot and contract, the spread gets bigger and bigger, it's gonna create pressure on either side of the transaction. Right, and so if spot is significantly higher than contract, it forces capacity, contract. capacity will leave, go to the spot market, That's right. and um, force rebids of contract rates higher. Yeah, so the carriers take advantage of those high spot rates, and they actually don't honor their contract rates, which is the re reason we have a big issue with the word contract, because it's not truly, con you can't enforce it. When One of the things that, that I learned early on is, when we were building this business, is I'd go to the folks in the commodity markets and talk about contract rates. They assumed these were enforceable agreements. They're not. Right, right, right. And that was really where the, the, the term contract sort of became a bigger issue. Right, so the spot being higher than contract is kind of what happened in 2017, 18. What's happening now, though, is it, it's widening into other directions. Spot so spot's falling down. way below contract. Shippers then chase those rates down. Yeah, and so the spread got as wide as, on a national average basis, about 46 cents a mile, which translated to about 24%. So that's a really significant spread. Um, shippers moved freight into the spot market. We've done studies um, and surveyed hundreds of shippers, and they've said that what really triggers them, what prompts them to, to move freight over to the spot market is if spot is between five and 15% lower than contract for 30 days or longer. Got it. And they said they'll move up to 30% of their freight into the spot market. So they're not gonna honor their uh, contractual agreements no. if the, the variance is so wide. No, all, and, and we, we see that parties in the market pull all three levers the promised volumes, the promised capacity, and the promised rates. Well, all, all those are subject volumes to Volumes are usually the first to, to, in terms of shipper commitments, they typically fall back volume. You had an interesting story you were telling me earlier about the fact that when you were talking to some of the your sources in the market, yep. about brokers, is that they were saying that their shippers were saying, if they weren't giving them the freight, they were saying they didn't have those lanes anymore, or something was happening to the production cycles or whatever, but then they were seeing the same exact lanes show up on load boards yes. that were supposed to be their freight, their contracted freight, that was no longer available for them. Right, they weren't getting uh, tendered at the agreed upon rate. Instead, they were seeing it on the spot market and the shippers were being really aggressive about the rates that they were posting. They were really testing the bottom of the market and it, yeah, obviously it prompts a pretty awkward conversation between the broker and the customer saying like, hey, how do we, get this freight that you already ordered <laughs> us. It's our contracted business yeah. that just happens to be on there. And I think, you know, being in the business, um, oftentimes shippers use the excuse of, you know, they're they're doing an inventory in their plant or they're reshuffling or they've lost that uh, customer on that lane. Or they change um, the transportation manager and say, you know, oh, well, you know, it's, it's like, this rate was too high, that's why we moved this guy to another division. Right, right. They don't really want... They don't want to own it, because they don't want to upset. It's almost like a ghost. You know, think about it in the world of, like, tendering, right. uh, which is not our version of tender. <laughs> yeah, yeah, someone they ghost else's. you. Yeah, they ghost you. They, they, they ghost you on the lane. It's like, I'm ghosting you on the lane. I'm now posting freight to a, uh, a, a the load board, so I'm going back into the market trying to find capacity. You're ghosted. You don't know what happened. You assume that the customer doesn't have the volume, and... Uh, that's what's exactly what's happening. And that's that's what's been really interesting is that we've seen, so 
you know, spot leads, vol spot leads contract rates, mm -hmm. but on a lag. And so right now, that spread is really compressing. Right. It was up to 24%, <laughs> now it's down to 14% because as contract has continued to kind of sag incrementally, spot has really come up a lot. So spot's putting pressure on those brokerage margins yeah. as it comes up because as capacity starts to evap. So carriers that had chased the spot business now are locking in longer term con contract rates or committed rates. Shippers have re sort of allocated their capacity. We're seeing pressure because the capacity is evaporating from the spot market. Uh, there's less capacity available for shippers and there's right. more demand because the volumes are up. And now what's happening is that um, effectively the, the spot rates are starting to firm. That really puts gonna put pressure on freight brokers. It puts pressure on freight brokers because it's not re like it's a lot easier for carriers to fall off of a con of contracted freight. They can just say, "I don't have a truck," right? Right. But if you're a broker, you what, said, "I'll give you capacity at any moment in time." Right. What's your? You don't have an excuse, really. Yeah. You can't. You can't really reject um, contracted freight unless you want to like burn that relationship. Right. Right. So that's. I think that's the sort of market participant that sees the most impact from this compressing spread because they can't really take advantage you know that they, they can't what when when their costs outrun what they're charging it's really hard for them to go to the shipper and yeah and their take know. rate is less they usually have to what ends up happening and what i've heard is that after losing money on a on a customer for a certain amount of time they literally just have to open up their books go to their customer and say hey look like yeah. we need to we need to talk if we were to keep working together because we're we were losing too much money yeah for sure for sure so that uh research report will be out next week yeah and so it's it's really interesting it's all about um how carriers shippers and brokers respond to the spread in contracted spot, how wide does it have to be and for how long for them to move freight back and forth or move capacity yeah, back Yeah, I think the, the mistake some people make in the market is to assume these things are static, is that freight's always in contract and some freight's always in spot. That's right. not true. No. It moves. It's it's in many ways like, like any other marketplace where uh, you have people taking advantage of those opportunities. No one's really married uh, in the market. There's right. a lot of dating around and tendering going on Yes, um, that have nothing to do with sort of consistency and committed commitments. It's more about what benefits either party. And that pendulum swings. We actually now have a, uh, a power index, a, a, a pricing power yeah. index that we rolled out, which basically shows from a zero to 100, 100 benefiting the carriers, zero benefiting the shippers, who has power in the market. And right now, uh, it's setting with, with shippers having more power than carriers. We'll see how that just barely though. It's at, it's at thirty five. Right. So it was it was leaning. It was biased towards shippers coming back for the medium. I mean, if we had done it in April and May, yeah, it'd it, be like, it, it very would have been at twenty. We didn't. Right uh, now, it's at a thirty five. We'll see how it ends up the rest of the year. A lot of that's going to depend on how strong the economy is. Certainly, some promise with uh, potential promise with tariffs or at least discussion. We don't know what will happen. Uh, but it's something to watch. The good news is freight volumes have maintained their surge. We've not seen that drop back. That's promising. We're also hearing from some of the larger asset-based carriers. J.B. Hunt has come out this week, as well as others have talked about that they're seeing more promising conditions nice. than perhaps they reported the uh, uh, last couple of months. So certainly a lot to look forward to. J.P., what do you look for for next week? I think that we're going to see in certain lanes, especially like into the southeast, Chicago to Atlanta, um, lanes like that, lanes like... LA to Seattle, I think will also go up. Uh, LA to Dallas, it really just depends on the capacity situation and how. A lot of it's going to be how many trucks are there. Container imports. Yeah, but uh, everything is still looking good from our point of view. Yeah, so we're, you're still bullish about the rest of the year. Yeah, I, I, I would I would maintain that. I would suspect that that shipper index, that pricing power index, will see, start to see it go more favorable to carriers as we get into peak, closer to peak. And we'll see what that looks like. It certainly looks like the economy from a consumer spending standpoint is going to hold up through the retail peak. So certainly uh, positive and bullish about that. Also, a lot of the analysts, the Wall Street analysts, are now upgrading the truckload sector because they're actually much more confident in the fact that we're at, we've we passed the bottoms of the cycle. Yeah, yeah, that's all that. Um, Schneider, JB Heim both got upgraded. Um, uh, Knight, Heartland also yeah. did as well. So certainly uh, promising signs. Well, JP, we'll be back next week. Uh, Always tune in weekly for the weekly rate update where JP and I dive into where the market been is where it's headed. You can also tune in to Freightways.com 
to just read about our uh, market commentary. John Paul Hampstead uh, is our writer that covers the freight markets and, and is constantly in uh, conversations with people that are seeing the action on the ground. So be sure to read his content. Uh, also, if you haven't got tickets for Freightways Live in November in Chicago on November 12th and 13th, be sure to do that. Prices go up every single month and it is, we're up. 3x, 300% versus last year in terms of participation so far. So we'll see where that ends up. It's going to be one hell of a party. Next week, tune in to the weekly rate update.